Contenders, Two Native Baseball Players, One World Series, by Tracy Sorrell, illustrated by Aragon Starr. Polo Grounds, New York City, Shide Park, Philadelphia. Bender, Myers. The World Weights, World Series, 1911, Game 1, bottom of the seventh inning. 50 telegraphers stand ready to share the action taking place in New York with Los Angeles, Havana, Tokyo, and around the globe. John Myers grips his bat. Charles Bender stands tall on the mound. Two friends making history. John and Charles are the first two citizens of Native nations to play against each other in the baseball championship. With the score tied at one, Charles winds up, fires the pitch, and... The hit, the whack. John doubles to left field. The next batter smacks another double. John speeds home from second and scores. His winning run puts the New York Giants up one game to none against Charles's team, the Philadelphia Athletics. Indian versus Indian. Newspapers recount the match as Indian against Indian. They call Charles and John Chief Bender and Chief Myers, respectively, though neither is a tribal leader. The insults get worse. One reporter writes about the two Redskins, while another wonders, now who's the best Indian? John and Charles can't show up and compete like their teammates. White fans, other players, managers, and sports writers constantly hurl slights and slurs about their native heritage. Charles and John are no strangers to challenges. Charles's childhood. Charles Albert Bender, Albert Bender, Al to his family, grew up on the White Earth Reservation in northwestern Minnesota. His Ojibwe mother and German American father struggled to care for their large family. At age seven, Al endured a long train ride with his two siblings and a few other Ojibwe children. The kids arrived at a year-round Indian boarding school in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, funded in part by the Federal Indian Department and run by the Episcopal Church. School life was strict, even abusive. Boys studied the Bible and performed manual labor like painting, installing windows, and farming. For a time, Al worked in the school laundry room to help pay for his stay there. Summer breaks found the children sent, sent to live with and work for white families in the country, harvesting crops and caring for animals on their farms. Al loved spending time in the woods and hunting when he got the chance. Al also loved baseball. He learned the game by watching older boys play. He even learned to make his own bats and balls like they did. He thought he might be a catcher until he got hit between the eyes with a pitch. John's childhood. John Torta's mayor's family and friends had a nickname for him too, Jack. He learned to play baseball in his Cahulia tribes reservation in Southern California. Like Al, Jack had a German American father, but he died when Jack was seven. His Cahulia Kohuya mother and a skilled basket maker worked as a hotel cook in nearby Riverside to support her children. Despite the pressure during that time to adopt white people's norms, Jack spoke the Kohuya language and stayed close to his family and culture. He played baseball on the reservation and in Riverside and got his start by catching his older brother's pitches. Jack was curious and intelligent although he wasn't able to finish school because he needed to work. Charles's teenage years. Al finally returned to the White Earth Reservation from boarding school at age 12, but life at home was still difficult and his father abusive. So Al and one of his older brothers ran away. That summer, they worked at another White Earth farm until a teacher from Carlisle Indian Industrial School visited, looking for boys. Al and his older brother volunteered to go, so he ended up back in Pennsylvania. Once again, Al had regular food, clothing, and shelter. 
but no Ojibwe community to nurture him and his cultural identity. Like the school in Philadelphia, Carlisle also forced Native children to assimilate and adopt the culture and Christian religion of white people. Founded by U.S. Army Colonel Richard Pratt, the school followed a strict military routine and schedule, which Al noticed right away. In the little free time he was allowed each afternoon, he enjoyed playing baseball with other boys. Although he didn't see it at first, Carlisle's coach, Pop Warner, eventually recognized Al's tenacity, character, and competitive spirit when the young man pitched. Al then made the team and won his first game. John's Journey to the Majors After leaving school, Jack, now usually called John, worked for the Santa Fe Railroad and played on the company's baseball team. When the railroad workers went on strike, John headed out, headed out on the road. He played baseball on some, some semi-pro teams, semi, semi teams in Southern California and across the Southwest. At a tournament in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a player on the opposing team became impressed with John's skills and size. He helped recruit John to play for Dartmouth College in football and baseball. At 5 feet 11 and 194 pounds, John looked like a football player and yet had no interest in the game. He played baseball for one season there before the college found out he didn't have a high school diploma. When Dartmouth let John go, he moved on to the minor leagues, where he competed on four different teams. Pickwicks, Senators, Butte Miners, St. Paul Saints. Charles's quick trip to the pros. During Al's time at Carlisle, he developed his baseball skills. His keen eyesight and intelligence helped him craft pitches that confused and frustrated batters. After graduating in 1902, Al, now called Charles, signed with the Philadelphia Athletics and made his professional pitching debut the following year. In his rookie season with the A's, 19-year-old Charles won 17 games and pitched over 200 innings, a rare feat in the 20th century for a pitcher his age. Charles gave up only about three runs per game, and he seldom walked any batters, a sign of his impressive control. The powerhouse team was led by legendary manager Connie Mack, who always called Charles Albert. Mack coached many great pitchers during his 50-year career. And he once said, if everything depended on one game, I just used Albert. John heads to New York. After bouncing around in the minors, John finally landed with the New York Giants under their celebrated manager, John McGraw. Two years later, John became the starting catcher at age 31. McGraw once described John as a vicious hitter and one of the best catchers in the National League now, a quick thinker. But John wasn't just about baseball. He also spoke out on the, about the injustices he saw happening to Native people across the country. Enduring the hate. Charles and John both loved to play, but they could never play in peace. Racism experienced outside the ballpark showed up inside of it, too. Their fellow Native pro baseball players faced the same racist insults that John and Charles heard every day. An overwhelmingly white sport, baseball collected managers, players, umpires, sports writers, and fans that mirrored the injustices of the segregated U.S. society. Regardless, Charles and John kept their game faces on. They each used their quick wit to deflect and diffuse the insults and rude treatment, most of the time. Sometimes they shouted back. Still, both were determined to make a living playing the game they loved. World Series action, friends face off. Just before the first game of the World Series in 1911, John poses on the field with Charles, whom he describes as one of the nicest people you'd ever meet. The New York Times prints this line, maybe they wish they had tomahawks in their hands instead of a bat and a baseball. At the height of their careers, Charles and John can't escape the racism that infests even one of the country's leading newspapers. Battling back and forth. Game one goes to the Giants, thanks to John's winning run. But Charles Athletics 
bounce back to take game two. Game three, close calls by the umpires, a dramatic home run, a high spikes up slide by a Giants outfielder stealing third, and extra innings, including John's almost home run at the top of the 11th. But the A's take the game and the series lead. And then rain for six days. Wrapping it up, when the series resumes, Charles holds the Giants to just two runs in the first inning to win game four, and the A's look ready to wrap the series up. But in front of the home crowd, John's Giants Eck, Eck, Giants Eck out a win with a sacrifice fly in the 10th inning of game five. Game six, Charles pitches. The Giants struggle, getting only two runs off him. His teammates back him up with their bats, scoring seven runs in the seventh inning alone. The A's win 13-2 in front of their fans, the 1911 World Series champions. Contenders always. After the 1911 season, Charles and John kept playing, and they reached the World Series the combined nine times. But despite all their professional achievements, name-calling by those around them at the ballpark and racist cartoons and depictions in the newspaper persisted. More than 100 years later, Native athletes today still face these same challenges. Tomahawk chops and derogatory chants and signs can be seen and heard at stadiums and ballparks across the country because of the permitted use of racist team mascots. From peewee to professional leagues, no other athletes in the United States face the kind of sanctioned mocking and dishonor of their culture the native players do. Moses Yellow Horse, Pawnee, 1921-22. Jim Thorpe, Sack and Fox, 1913-1915, 1917-1919. Ben Tincup, Cherokee, 1914 to 15, 1918, 1928. Allie Reynolds, Muskogee Creek, 1942 to 54. Jacoby Ellsbury, Colorado River Tribes, 2007 to 2017. Joba Chamberlain, Winnebago, 2007 to 16. Kyle Lose, Winton, 2001 to 2018. Ryan Hesley, Cherokee. 2019 to present. Author's note. Charles Bender and John Myers faced off in the 1913 World Series. While the Giants ended with a better regular season record, they lost four games to one against the Athletics. Charles pitched the first and fourth games and won both. John injured his hand during warmups before the second game and sat out the rest of the series, which hampered the Giants. Over the course of his career, Charles pitched in five World Series with the A's and won three of them. In all, he played 16 seasons in the big leagues, won 212 games, and posted a .625 winning percentage. He credited with, he's credited with creating the slider, a pitch still used today in baseball, among an incredible list of other accomplishments. Charles stayed close to the game for the rest of his life even managing minor league teams in the East for a time. He was elected into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1953. John caught in four championship series, but his teams never took home the trophy. He spent nine years in the majors and led the Giants in battling from 1911 to 1913 with a .332 average, the third highest in the National League at the time. He played and briefly managed in the minor leagues before leaving the game and returning to work in the Cohia, Cohia Reservation. Timeline, 1880. John Jack Tortoise Myers was born in Riverside, California in July to John Mayer and Fel Felicite Tortes. He is a citizen of the Santa Rosa Band of Cohia Indians. 1884, Charles Al Albert Bender is born in the Park Ridge Lake area of Crow Wing County, Minnesota, in May to Albertus Bliss Bender and Mary Razor. His maternal family is from the Mississippi Band of Ojibwe Indians. 1880, 
The Bender family moves to the White Earth Reservation in northwestern Minnesota to tribal land allotted to their mother and her children. Citizens from several Ojibwe bands were relocated to this reservation. 1897, Louis Sack Alexis of the Penobscot Nation joins the Cleveland Spiders and becomes the first native player in the National League, an independent professional baseball league in the United States at that time. 1903. Two independent professional baseball leagues, the National League and the American League, combined to form the Major League Baseball, MLB, and establish a World Series, where the teams from both leagues play for an annual championship title. Bender joins the Philadelphia Athletics as a starting pitcher in 1903. He is one of the tallest pitchers during the time at 6 feet 2 inches. 1904, Bender marries Mary Marie Clement of Detroit, Michigan. 1908, at age 28, Myers joins the New York Giants as a catcher late in the season. Jim Thorpe is his teammate from 1913 until the team waives Myers' contract in 1915, and the Brooklyn Robins pick him up. 1909, Myers speaks up in defense of Chito Harjo and other Muscogee Nation citizens who oppose the federal government's allotment of tribal lands. 1910, Myers marries Anna Brower of Maryland. 1917, Myers finishes his major league career with the Boston Braves. Except for a cameo appearance in 1925 with the Chicago White, Scott, White Sox, Bender wraps up his MLB career with the Philadelphia Phillies and the National League crosstown rival, the National League crosstown rival of his former team, the A's. 1924. All citizens of Native nations receive U.S. citizenship after President Kelvin Coolidge signs the Indian Citizenship Act. 1947. Jackie Robinson integrates MLB for African Americans on April 15th. 1953, Charles Bender is elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. 1954, Bender dies in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 22nd before the NBHOF induction ceremony in Cooperstown, New York on August 9th. His widow, Marie, accepts the plaque in his stead. 1971, John Myers dies on July 25th in San Bernardino, California. 1972, Charles Bender and John Myers are inducted into the American Indian Athletic Hall of Fame as part of the inaugural class. 2022, Native baseball players still play in the major leagues, including four pitchers who are Cherokee Nation citizens, Dylan Bundy, John Gray, Ryan Hesley, and Adrian Hauser, all pitch right-handed like Bender. Quotes, somebody, ball, Lampton, Indian against Indian. Sources and author's acknowledgments and artist's acknowledgments. On the field, history is made.